So, and before I start, I want to say yeah, I'm impressed by uh, the video, which I think is terrific, and also by um, the um, all of the upfront stuff that you've done for this. And I just want to highlight that um, that the code, the little QR code or whatever that you get the the coupon for my seminar, the coupon code is unlock. And on that page, it said unlocking, but the code is actually unlock. Um, that's my fault. <laughs> I had told them one thing and then I made a different coupon. But in any event, I just want to make sure you have that if you want it. Um, and if you have any trouble, if you decide you want to register and you have any trouble with it, just send me an email. You'll see how to contact me. So um, thank you all very much for coming. I'm delighted to be able to speak with you and I'm delighted that this group is getting going to support adults with ADHD. Um, today, I'm going to give you the very, very short version, an introduction to um, ADHD and relationships. Um, it is a really important topic and a great deal of progress can be made in your relationship um, once you start to understand better some of the things that are going on in it that are related to not only ADHD, but also responses to ADHD. So it's both partners, it's not just the ADHD partner that contribute to the dynamics. So having said that, let me get right in. Um, I'm going to give about a half an hour talk and then after that I will take as many questions as, uh, as we can in the time that, I, that I, I have allotted to me, so. Uh, okay, in a nutshell, um, ADHD, adult ADHD, as, as was reflected in the video, um, most likely impacts many areas of your life, not just your relationship. Um, and many adults don't actually know, they don't have a diagnosis for ADHD in the, in the U.S. where we are um, ahead in terms of diagnosing ADHD. There's a lot more awareness of it. Um, it's estimated that about 80% of adults who have ADHD don't know it. So those of you who are here and listening, you're one step ahead already um, by um, having um, started to interact with the idea that you have ADHD and learning about it. And knowledge really is power in this situation, so it's, it's really great that you are um, continuing to pursue that. Within the relationship, um, ADHD and also those responses to ADHD um, cause very predictable issues. Um, and the impact is much greater than people assume that it is. So, uh, and, and once I start talking about some of the patterns that show up, uh, you'll probably recognize yourself. And it's not because I've been you know, living at your house, it's just because these patterns are so predictable. Um, and the good news is if they're predictable, then also you can um, sort of get in the way of the patterns. Um, but it is really important to understand that it is both the ADHD and also the responses to the ADHD, how a couple interacts around the symptoms and how they understand and interpret the symptoms is really important. One of the things that I like to uh, start with <clears throat> is the idea that if you are with a partner who does not have ADHD, in other words, you're in what I call a mixed couple, those partners are much more different than they realize they are. There's always issues around family background or expectations or in, in many cases, but not all um, gender uh, that you bring. Those are all differences that are very obvious. The less obvious is that the brain wiring for a partner who has ADHD versus a partner who does not have ADHD is quite different. It has to do with the underpinnings of ADHD, which are about neurochemistry. Um, people who have ADHD typically have less dopamine in their brain. Um, their brain uh, creates uh, much more emotional content uh, than uh, people who don't, um, typically. Uh, and there are other differences as well. So what that means is that you can be having the same experience. You can be in the same room doing the same thing. And yet, how, what you take away from that experience or even how you experience it will be quite different um, simply because of the way your brain functions. Um, some examples, the ADHD brain, I like to sort of think of it in a um, non-medicinal, non-medical way 
as being unfiltered. A lot of stuff comes into the uh, ADHD brain um, that wouldn't necessarily um, come into the non-ADHD brain. That can be a real advantage if you are, for example, a very creative person or someone who is an emergency room doctor, someone who might be in the military um, who has to be very alert and able to take in unexpected things. That those are all um, that then that is a real benefit. If you're in a sort of a daily life situation where you're with a partner who really wants you to focus on them and not on anything else because they're talking to you or whatever, then the, the fact that a lot of other things are coming into your attention is not such a benefit. So um, these brains are very different <clears throat> um, in some, some situations. The differences are positive for the ADHD brain. For some situations, they're negative. But the thing to remember is that um, how you pay attention, how you remember, um, what you actually see um, and how you interpret those things are uh, much more different than couples realize. This is part of the power of understanding what ADHD is all about. Um, uh, once you start to be able to interpret it better, um, you'll stop uh, hopefully misinterpreting what's going on. So today I'm going to be talking about a couple of the most common uh, specific patterns that show up. Um, when I teach my seminar and, and when I try to work with couples in my books and et cetera, I provide specific tools to help you um, navigate those patterns. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the necessity for couples to really engage around ADHD and the importance of um, emotions in each of you. One of the things that's important to start with, however, is the ADHD symptoms in particular are very difficult in relationships because they tend to be the opposite of what people think they're getting when they sign up for their um, romantic relationship. Let me give you some examples. Distractibility is the number one symptom of adult ADHD. Even if you have the hyperactive version of ADHD, there's typically distraction, um, but that's a, that's a huge, it's chronic distraction. Most of the time you have issues with distraction. When you sign up for a romantic relationship, what you are expecting is your partner is going to pay attention to you. Those things are in direct uh, conflict. Um, many people with ADHD have difficulty organizing or planning or staying on task, which directly is um, in opposition to the expectation, which is that your partner will be a partner with you. They will share the responsibility. When they say they're going to do something, they'll follow up on it. Um, they'll be able to complete paperwork, et cetera. And many people with ADHD really struggle with that. Um, like mentioned, I believe uh, time management issues or being always being late and the expectation actually um, of many and couples is that um, that you'll be there um, when, ex when you ex expect it. If you say you're going to be there at 6 p.m., that that's when you'll show up. So you can see the things on the left really are um, symptoms and then symptom um, issues that come out of those. The things on the right are what people expect. This is the heart of uh, romantic relationships. So this is why there's so much pressure from the ADHD. Um, and it's also why these patterns are so predictable. Uh, and I will give you an example in just a moment of, of a, you know, how this plays out. Uh, so, so all of these things as short-term memory issues are documented as being issues for adults with ADHD. Um, the last one, the retreat from conflict, is not a symptom, but it is a common coping strategy that adults with ADHD use. Um, you can imagine when people grow up having people telling them, oh, there must be something wrong with you, or them even telling themselves, um, as you saw in the video, um, I, you know, I don't quite fit in, I don't know what's going on. Over time, you stop trying to um, uh, engage and stop trying to do the things that the symptoms are getting in the way of, um, and you may very well just sort of escape or, or move something out of the, out of the now and, and, and not deal with them. And again, that's the opposite of what a partner would be expecting, and it's also a coping strategy which, while common, isn't, um, isn't actually very effective in the long term um, because people start to pursue you. So I talked about the patterns that the, the, if you have ADHD, you have these symptoms that are on the left side or some grouping of them. Um, and so you're running into most likely these issues that are on the right side. And these relationships really struggle. 
but they don't have to. And let me give you an example of the power of knowing about um, these symptoms. So again, a lot of adult ADHD is undiagnosed. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I have something in my throat. Um, and you, that doesn't mean you don't have the symptoms, right? It just means you don't know why, what's going on. You, you, you can't figure out uh, why these things are showing up and why you don't seem to be able to be on time or do the things that um, other people seem to do so easily. Um, so again, knowledge is power. So I talk when I uh, talk with couples about something I call symptom response response, which is what SRR stands for at the top of this slide. Um, and and it, it starts with some kind of symptom or characteristic behavior of ADHD. Now, when you're using this model of there's an input and then there's a response and a response to the response, it doesn't have to start with an ADHD symptom. In this case, that's what I'm doing. But uh, this is a useful model just to think about interactions between the two of you. It could start with something that, that a non-ADHD partner is doing. Um, uh, you know, just as easily. But in this case, what I want to talk about is how the symptoms can be the start of an interaction between partners that is, um, is not healthy for the relationship. So in this case, the symptom that we're starting with is distractibility. Again, that top symptom of adult ADHD. And uh, so what happens, the, the behavior that happens when you, are, when you have chronic distraction is that uh, you are paying attention to whatever is coming at you, whatever is immediate. And this is one of the confusing factors of, of many um, with ADHD, and that is a partner will say, hey, XYZ thing is really important, or I really care about this thing. There's a hierarchy to how you care or what you're thinking about and, and wanting to do. And then the partner with the ADHD who sees everything as sort of similar, it's because the, the thing that they pay attention to, that, you, that when you have ADHD you pay attention to, is the thing that's immediate, the thing that's grabbing your attention. The, the joke in the US is the thing that's shiny. Um, those are the things that draw the attention of somebody who has a brain that is wired like that ADHD thing. It's a very reward focused brain. So things that are a high interest are very rewarding for the ADHD brain. So the behavior, the characteristic behavior when you are very distractible is the thing that captures your attention is the thing that you focus on and that your partner might be one of those things or might not be one of those things. It might be something completely different. And so um, the partner ends up um, feeling as if they're not getting enough attention. And that manifests in a bunch of different ways. People will say things like, um, I feel lonely in this relationship. My partner never pays attention to me. Um, you know, I've just said something is really important and my partner is ignoring it. It's not that they're ignoring it actively. It's that they're distracted by other things. So the partner's misinterpretation of the ADHD symptom of distractibility is my partner doesn't pay special attention to me, even though he or she should, therefore my partner doesn't love me. It's a very logical interpretation of the behavior if you don't know about the ADHD. The result of that interpretation or misinterpretation is that the partner starts to try to get more attention, right? That's what a partnership is about for, for most people. And so they start to, you know, it might start out with um, sexy lingerie, or it might start out with special, um, you know, things that you do for that partner. But over time, as the, as the distractibility continues, uh, it becomes increasingly intrusive, increasingly negative, um, anything that one can do to get more attention. Um, and until you know about that as a symptom, it's going to continue because it isn't something that the ADHD partner is doing intentionally to hurt their partner. It's just a symptom of ADHD. So over time, this interaction, the trying to get attention becomes more and more intrusive and negative, um, may end up in verbal abuse. Uh, it certainly often is in anger and frustration and sometimes yelling or those kinds of things. And eventually the ADHD partner starts to respond to that kind of non-ADHD or other ADHD partner behavior, and they start to fight back 
or they start to avoid or escape um, because it doesn't feel very good. And of course, as that ADHD partner tries to fight back or escape, that's not what the other partner wants. And so they double down and push harder, right? So they get try to gain more attention. And then of course there's further escape and the fight starts to be over the responses to each other, not over the original symptom. So as you can see, this would be a very negatively reinforcing uh, cycle where the relationship just gets harder and harder and harder. Now, the importance about knowing about this is that you can, in fact, accurately interpret the distractible behavior. You can make it neutral instead of being hurtful by knowing, hey, what, this is actually a symptom of ADHD. It isn't that your partner doesn't love you. It's that your partner has a symptom called distractibility. And you can then change that initial response to that partner so that it does, you know, so that it's much more positive. So for example, you could imagine if you knew about ADHD and you had an open conversation between you about ADHD, where you could go to your partner and say, hey, um, you're particularly distracted this week, or I'm starting to feel um, kind of uh, lonely or, or you know, under underappreciated this week or whatever. Let's go out for a date and reconnect. And you go out on a date and you have a nice time. <clears throat> you're reassured that your partner really does love you. <clears throat> and the outcome of that interaction is much, much more positive. Uh, you don't get into that long-standing fight. The frustration doesn't keep going. So you can see the difference between the outcomes when you understand ADHD in this, in this situation versus when you don't is huge for the relationship. And there are many situations in the ADHD impacted relationship. You saw on the previous chart, the number of things that are in conflict with what your expectations are. Once you start to understand ADHD better, huge changes can happen in your relationship. It's part of why I enjoy doing what I do so well is because as people learn these things, there's so many changes that can be made. One of the things that does uh, help a great deal is for the ADHD partner to actually optimize their management of their ADHD. Now, um, I talk about a three-legged approach to this, the first two legs of which have been verified in research over and over and over again, the third leg of which I add because I work with couples. And the idea of this is that you need a, uh, a robust and complete way to manage ADHD. It is not just about medications. In fact, medications alone are not optimal, and that's been shown in research. You need to at least have the medications and the behavioral legs, and I'm gonna talk about those in just a second. Um, in, the, in terms of a couple, you do, you do need to add the third. And in order to optimize the treatment and make the best progress, you also need to choose target symptoms. So if you have ADHD, you have multiple symptoms, like six, eight, something like that, a, a, a more than one or two that are meaningful in your life. But some of those symptoms are more important than others in terms of how much they get in the way of your relationship or your life. So the first thing that you do as you think about treatment is you go, which are the one or two, maybe three, but usually one or two symptoms that I really want to focus in on that I think will give me the greatest chance of immediate improvement. And then you choose, because there are huge numbers of strategies to manage ADHD, you choose the ones that work for you against those specific target symptoms. And that helps you move forward more quickly. So let me talk to you a little bit about the, the three legs and what they do and, and why, um, why I organize it this way. Leg one is things that change the physiology of your brain. This is a neurochemical issue. It also, there are other issues as well about brain structure, but uh, that's not, not uh, um, really changeable greatly. You can, you can do a little bit, but that's, that's, that's the detailed version. Um, physiological changes that have been shown in research to change how the brain functions include medications, but also include exercise, improving sleep hygiene, mindfulness training, meditation, uh, to a lesser degree, fish oil. 
The medications are at the top of this list because they are um, they have the greatest effect size. Medications can work for uh, people with ADHD. About 70 to 80 percent of adults can find a medication for ADHD that will significantly improve their symptoms without having significant side effects. That's a big, big number in the mental health uh, field. Um, but, but medications alone don't do it. They like to say pills don't teach skills, and that's very true. So adding exercise, for example, which helps with mood stabilization and also helps with uh, windows of focus. About three hours after you exercise, you can get greater focus. And so you can use that tactically. For example, if you need more energy and more focus in the afternoon, you can exercise at lunchtime and that will help you bring um, gain more focus. This is about target symptoms, right? If you want to change how much you, how emotional you are, you might use certain kinds of medications like a, a Wellbutrin or like the medications that are used for something called rejection sensitive dysphoria, which is sort of the extreme part of emotions for ADHD. If you want to do focus, you might use stimulant medications. You might do um, aerobic exercise and you might do sleep hygiene issues. So this is the importance of target symptoms. Now, leg two is about behavioral changes that the ADHD partner makes. There are millions of these, including gamifying things so that they're more fun and more motivating, using calendars and organizers, delegating responsibilities to others, creating uh, all sorts of things that you can do to essentially take what is what I think of as a sort of an unstructured brain and creating structures, outlines or things like that, that help you function better and more reliably. That's sort of the basic underpinnings of why you choose those behavioral structures that you do. The third leg is interactive. This is where I do a lot of my work um, with couples. It's you with the ADHD and other people around you. What kinds of routines and understandings and behaviors do you need to put into place to be more successful? So I teach things like verbal cues, how to set up a good verbal cue so that you can stop an argument before it takes off, or so you can tell a partner that you're feeling overwhelmed, or so that as you're, for example, trying to get out of the habit of covering things up, that you might uh, uh, be able to have a little do-over or maybe to address um, verbal interruptions, those kinds of things. It's also things like chore coordination meetings, um, doing time, having those dates or attend time, things that help connect you, um, maybe some emotional check-ins. I'll give you some examples across these, uh, these legs later in the presentation. Um, but anyway, you can see that if you pick as many of these things as you can from all three of these legs that are specific to your target symptoms, you're going to have a much more robust way to manage your ADHD. And that is really important as you start to address the symptom response response cycles in your relationship like the one I just talked about. Um, it's one thing for your partner to be able to say, hey, you're particularly distracted, let's go on a date. It's another thing, even better, if you're less distracted because you've got the physiological treatments and the behavioral treatments and even some of these interactive things in place. That understanding of what that distraction looked like and being able to say, hey, let's go for a date, that's an example of a leg three interactive strategy. You both understand ADHD, it's neutral, and you're responding around it in a certain way. So I talked about patterns. And I want to talk about one that is um, one of the most painful patterns for many couples. Again, to give you an example, um, there's uh, a lot of detail in what I do, but I wanted to give you this, uh, this overview. This is what I call parent-child dynamics. Um, and I'm talking about a parent, adult parent um, role and an adult person who's in a childlike role in the relationship. So I'm talking about two partners. Um, what happens in this is that the more organized partner, so in a mixed relationship, that's the non-ADHD partner. In a relationship where you both have ADHD, that's the more organized ADHD partner. That person takes on too much responsibility in the relationship and typically around household tasks and responsibilities. 
and they're trying to control too much. This is a natural response to um, the sort of chaos and um, unpredictability of the relationship. The, the non-ADHD partner's tendency is to say, things feel very chaotic. I need to wrap my arms around and really make it work better. And they just start managing stuff um, because they have the executive function skill set to be able to do so. But they're over-functioning in the relationship. And so they start to feel frustrated, unhappy, resentful, angry, etc. The ADHD partner who's in that childlike role um, has less responsibility. They're under-functioning because the ADHD is not yet optimally managed. They start to feel resentful that they don't have the status in the relationship that they feel they should. Um, they're often defiant or unhappy. They often will retreat or disengage because they don't feel they're being treated well enough. Um, and, uh, and so this is a, one of those other reinforcing negative cycles. You've got one partner who says, we need to be more organized. Let's get more organized. And the other partner who says, you're not giving me any space. I don't like this. Um, and they're not engaging um, around this uh, as predict predictably or productively as they could. There are un Productive ADHD, non-ADHD partner responses and how they tend to set up is let's, um, I'm going to win the battle right now, but they end up losing the war. So it's nagging, critiquing, educating, trying to anger, you know, you're angry and you try, it almost ends up like a kind of a bullying. There's aggression. Um, they can move into even verbal abuse. Um, extreme actions and things like what this partner said. I yell at my partner because if I don't really get in his face, he ignores me and I've asked him politely three times before. Um, the problem is that you yell at your partner and that might make something happen right then because it's so uncomfortable. But in the long term, the relationship suffers because the, the partner's like, why do I want to spend time with this person? They're always yelling at me. They're always angry, right? And so they retreat. And so you're losing, you're losing the relationship, even though you might get that thing done right away. ADHD partners have their own set of unpredictable or unproductive, they're actually predictable, unproductive responses. Um, for ADHD partners, it tends to be a sort of a barbell. Either at one end of the spectrum, you, they don't confront the problem, it just sort of goes away for them and moves out of their attention range. Or, at the other end of the spectrum, they just blow it up completely again so it gets out of their um, need to, t to pay attention to it. Um, so you'll see um, stonewalling, you'll see anger and aggression, you'll see a lot of defensiveness, denial that ADHD is even really an issue, lots of arguing, lots of retreat. So again, Either, you know, either sort of move away from the problem because it feels uncomfortable and maybe that they don't, you know, I don't have the skills to handle this and this is just, I don't want to deal with it or, or blowing things up. Neither of those works. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and so this is where I do my work <laughs> um, is helping partners understand the dynamics, um, become much more educated about the ADHD and understand where the really the points of leverage are to improve the relationship and some of the points of leverage the when you're in the parent-child dynamic that must stop it isn't healthy it's really demeaning to both people it's demeaning to the partner who doesn't have the ADHD and who's managing too much they're just incredibly resentful typically it's also demeaning to the partner who doesn't have enough status. So one of the things that um, I try to teach people is how do you get out of this? I mean, these, one of the reasons I talked about treatment is part of the way you get out of this is to help the ADHD partner be able to be on time, to do things more um, dependably, to be able to manage that ADHD better, while also helping the other partner stop managing things, which is part of the issue, right? Over-functioning is over-functioning and, and there are ways to set up um, boundaries and systems in the relationship so that, that partner isn't doing too much stuff or isn't doing as much as they're doing. So equal status, moving away from parent and child to a more equal partnership is truly critical in these relationships. Um, 
And you will have, you want to have a situation where you're both equally important, your opinions and your priorities are equally important, but you understand that, yeah, you're going to have different experiences, different approaches, your brains function differently. You, you know, you make the assumption as human beings that other people function the same way you do. And that's just not true in this case. Um, they don't. And so that's an important thing to understand. So equal status is really important. Engaging, or as John Gottman, who's one of the most famous U.S. researchers into relationships says, turning towards your partner um, and dealing with things constructively, again, critically important. You will approach things differently. And sometimes you'll look at your partner and go, wow, I have no idea why you do it that way. <laughs> That's okay. You don't have to do it the same way, but being able to turn towards each other and engage um, is really important. And it's scary to do this if you have a longstanding um, pattern of fighting and turning away from each other. It takes courage to be able to do this as well as knowledge. I haven't talked much about the emotional side of ADHD, but emotional dysregulation uh, or emo what they call emotional lability, quick, very quick uh, moves towards very large emotions. Um, is a core characteristic of adult ADHD. Um, and so um, getting that tamed is in, in a very important part of stabilizing relationships impacted by ADHD. Um, people who have these sorts of very large, very quick emotions that have always had them, think of that as sort of the way it is, the way who I am. Turns out that's not the case. Um, you can calm these emotions, sometimes quite dramatically, and when you do, it has a huge positive impact on your life. Doesn't mean you won't feel angry at the appropriate times. It does mean um, once you start to do this, you might not blast your partner out of the, out of the water because they looked at you funny. Um, and that kind of instability in the relationship is one of the huge struggles. So I talk with partners about bringing their best selves to the relationship, and very importantly, it's both of you. If you're in that parenting role, for example, you are contributing negatively to the relationship in terms of, of how close you can be. If you're in that childlike role, you're contributing negatively. So it's really about both people being able to improve um, what they're doing. Okay, I said I would give you some examples. I have um, this and then uh, one more slide and then I'll take questions. Um, but I want to give you some examples of a different way to interact um, with each other and also with the ADHD. Um, so um, I had a man come to me, a person who did not have ADHD, come to me uh, complaining about his wife who did have ADHD or does. And uh, what he said is, please tell my wife that she needs to put her clothes away when after she does the laundry. Um, he wanted me to, you know, give her all the strategies for that. And instead, what I said to him is, gee, she's leaving her clothes in the, in the dryer. That sounds like a great system to me. She knows where the clothes are. She knows they're clean. She can just wander down and grab them and she can get out of the house on time and get to work on time. That's a really good system. <laughs> so that wasn't what he expected. Um, and, you know, as long as she had a laundry basket somewhere near there so that if he needed to use the dryer. He could just move um, her stuff out of the dryer. Um, it's a great system. People with ADHD don't need to do the same systems that quote unquote everybody else does. They need to do systems that work for them and that are within a reasonable, ba reasonable boundaries. She wasn't leaving her laundry on the dining room table so that nobody could eat lunch. She was leaving it in the dryer where she could find it. Um, and so that's great. Why should she have to put her stuff away into drawers and figure out where everything goes nice and neat and do something that's so boring and doesn't really fit with um, the way she functions? Um, another uh, woman talked to me about um, cleaning up her kitchen and she had real problems doing this. It was one of these boring sort of endless tasks that she hated and she decided to use a common ADHD strategy, which is to gamify something. Um, in this case, she would set uh, a timer uh, for 10 minutes and then race the timer to see how much of the kitchen she could clean up in that amount of time. And the, the racing the timer made it fun and gave her motivation, gave her a little adrenaline push, and then she was able to do it. At first, her husband was like, what are you doing? Because he doesn't do it that way or wouldn't do it that way. And she, you know, she told him she was trying to make it more fun. 
and uh, and and that worked. Uh, again, just because you don't do it some way doesn't mean that your partner shouldn't do it that way. Um, many people with ADHD are what we call night owls. They have trouble getting out of the bed or getting out of the house. And so there's an opportunity to set multiple alarms, particularly if something is across the room. You have to stand up from your desk or get up out of bed to actually turn the alarm off um, is one way to disconnect. Some people have trouble disconnecting or transitioning from one thing to another when they have ADHD. So that's a strategy for that. And lots of times transition time is something to take into account overtly um, that people with ADHD, because uh, many don't have a good sense of time, often don't do. I talked with a man who had trouble getting out of the house on time. And when we looked at it a little more deeply, it turned out that's because he, when his partner said, hey, let's leave at 6 p.m., he thought 6 p.m. was when he needed to start his transition. And he had about a 45 minute transition routine that included changing his clothes and walking the dog. So obviously that was not a good fit. Um, people, I teach couples how to set up verbal cues. There are specific steps to how to create a, a, a effective verbal cue where there's a set of words that you say and a predetermined response to those words to change the direction of an interaction. For example, not to move into an escalated argument or to notify your partner that you're feeling overwhelmed, uh, or to identify things like parenting behaviors, whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, and those can be very effective. I also teach something called a learning conversation, which is a very structured conversation for things that are emotional topics, very difficult to talk about, and you need deeper understanding and also not to allow the thing to escalate. So it's a very slow but structured conversation. I encourage couples to do regular chore or task coordination, which helps move them away from parent-child where one person would be the manager and would be delegating and the other person um, would be receiving or doing rather than being um, having a, a say. Uh, and it's important to stay in communication around what's getting done or not to alleviate the anxiety that the um, more organized partner might be feeling. On the emotional side of things, I had a couple where there was a lot of anxiety in the this case male ADHD partner, and he would get he would keep it all inside because he was embarrassed about it, and then he would start making decisions that weren't in his best interests or in the relationship's best interest. So they set up a nightly routine where they finished this sentence: "The most important thing you need to know about me today is," and then they would fill that in, and the other partner would listen, and it was transformative for how he was behaving, how he felt, how the relationship worked. Um, because he was able to say, the most important thing you need to know about me today is I'm starting to feel anxious about X and get it out so that it was releasing the pressure on him. Um, for connecting, my husband and I used to um, go downtown. We used to live in Boston, uh, drop our son off at a rehearsal and then spend three hours in the afternoon just doing something fun. And we set it up so that it was a scheduled time, which was um, appealing to me as the more organized partner. And then when we got down there, we would open up um, the, our iPad and look at what was going on in the city that day. And we'd do something spontaneous, which also was appealing and intriguing um, for my partner. So lots of different ways to start to engage around ADHD, to incorporate it in a non-judgmental way into your relationship. So they talked about resources. You do need to learn more about this to be able to start to imp um, implement it. Um, my website is at ADHDmarriage.com. I give you this because it's probably the best website in the world on this topic. Um, tons of information, and I don't say that to brag, it's just I've been doing this for a really long time. Um, I give this couple seminar three times a year. With the time shift, um, unless you can do it in the morning, um, may not be a good time for you. I encourage either the self-study or, which is a, just a full recording of the most recent session, or you can sign up for the live one and set a time that works for both of you and keep the uh, weekly meetings as a way to sort of um, help you push through the, the study. Um, I do have these two books. I provide support groups. Um, again, whether the timing would work or not is unclear, um, but I do provide support groups and small group work for non-ADHD partners for um, ADHD partners, and, and there's some um, courses around emotions and triggers. So there's quite a bit of um, stuff to do. So with that, um, I want to go move it back to Moon Lake to um, be able to answer questions for everybody. 
Do you hey, want Grace, me to stop uh, sharing my screen? Sure, let's do that. Okay. Oh, there we go. I'm already unshared. <laughs> By the way, I look a lot different from my, my picture and I haven't um, changed that yet. So <laughs> okay. anyway. Uh, thank you, Melissa. It's been, um, every time I listen to you again, I learn something new. And the best thing about it is it's just so practical. It's really things that we can, you know, um, put into practice in our lives. And I think that's so, 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 so important. Um, and also, um, I think in terms of the questions that we've received so far, uh, whether it's live in this chat or ahead of time, uh, they fall into a couple of main categories, I can see. Um, one of the first ones actually is about acceptance of ADHD. Whether it's the non-ADHD spouse suspecting that the ADHD spouse has ADHD, but it's just not been diagnosed yet. Or the other flip side is when, um, you know, the person with ADHD has just discovered that and they're so excited and they're hoping that the non-ADHD spouse can understand them, but it's just not happening. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that and you know, what kind of tips can you give? Well, a couple of different things. Um, it's great. If you have just found out about it and you're excited, that's great. There is something called hyper-focus with ADHD. And so you could get totally hyper-focused into it. And the other partner might be going, what? Because what they don't want to hear is that um, ADHD is be, being used as an excuse for continuing the issues that have been going on. So the, so the trick is, first of all, it will take a, to, uh, a certain amount of time, I often say maybe like a year, to get the evaluation, figure out what the target symptoms are, get through some of the treatment stuff, and also start to understand and reinterpret your life through the lens of, of ADHD. Um, a lot of people, um, at least in the US, feel great grief that they didn't learn about it when they were younger. There are a lot of things that have happened in their lives that they wish had happened differently. Um, and so you work, even working through that takes a certain amount of, of effort. Um, but uh, I would say uh, get, uh, get as much information as you can because that's useful. Allow that your partner may well accept or think about the ADHD or the possibility of ADHD at a very different rate of speed than you do and that that's okay. It's part of the differences of your experience. And then the most important thing is that that ADHD partner, if they're the one driving this, understands that it isn't about knowledge, it's about changes of behavior. So you need the knowledge in order to change the behavior, but for the other partner, where the rubber hits the road is really around the changes of behavior. So how you're in starting to interact differently, et cetera. A lot of people will take um, my seminar just to sort of get the same language, get on the same page, get the uh, some of these strategies and stuff, um, or reading the book or whatever uh, works, but just starting to think about this stuff and then do stuff. That The, the transition from knowledge to doing is hard um, for many people, and that's where the key is for getting your partner on board. If you have a resistant partner who doesn't, you think might have ADHD and doesn't really want to engage with that idea, be empathetic to it. It's hard, uh, particularly if you think that engaging with the idea of having ADHD means you are going to get blamed for all of the struggles in your relationship. Um, this is one of the reasons why I stress it's not just the ADHD partner, it's also the responses to the ADHD. You both have changes to make. Um, so neutralizing the ADHD, not focusing on, oh, this is a horrible thing or whatever, because that's really not the point, uh, is um, really um, trying to just say, hey, you know, this is one avenue to uh, working about. Let's, let's explore it and see what happens. Being a, having a much more gentle approach um, is more likely to work. The person will be less defensive. But you need to look underneath. I did actually, and I think it's probably available, I did a presentation at the CHAD conference um, in the fall about um, how to get a resistant partner engaged. And, and the presentation was you know, nine reasons that partners resist getting engaged with ADHD and then what to do about those specific reasons. So looking underneath, what is it that my partner is struggling with um, specifically and how do I respond to that is useful. Thank you. Um, again, you said the difficulty is you know, trans transitioning from knowledge in your head to actually doing something about it. And that's something all ADHD has struggled with. Yeah. So that makes it extra challenging. But I think, as you said, you know, the main thing is that both parties move towards each other. 
And, and it's uh, not just ADHD partner. Think about everybody who, for example, wants to lose weight and has trouble actually doing what they need to do to lose weight. It's the human, it's human nature to learn first and then try to figure out what, you know, and it's hard to, to implement change. It's just hard. I guess the, the key is that, you know, there has to be this um, mutual um, agreement that this is something that both sides want to work on. And it's not just on one side, but it's actually both parties. Yes. And that's where it starts. Um, the other question um, is also, um, it's more to do with emotions. And particularly uh, because we know that for many people with ADHD, um, there's an element of sensitivity to criticism. Mm -hmm. Or some people say rejection, sensitive dysphoria. So when there's communication, it is not unusual for someone to feel really um, judged, criticized, they're not good enough, they're not measuring up. And, and then resentment builds up. So how do you get away from that feeling on, on the partner's side that's being criticized, you know, feeling that resentment and from the other side, feeling that anger and, you know, like why are you always doing that? And you know, how long do you have to put up with this? Like, how do you manage this? <laughs> this is like the heart of the, this is the, this is it in a nutshell, right? Um, so a bunch of different things to think about um, in this. First of all, um, there is a great deal of sensitivity and it, uh, it has to do with a whole bunch of different um, things, some of which are environmental because p adults who have ADHD often grow up with people telling them, you know, if you just tried harder, you could do better. And they know they're trying really hard. And so that doesn't, you know, that feels uh, almost like an impossibility uh, to them. Uh, and and have had a lot of critique over the years, and so they become more sensitive to it. They don't really want to go through that. Um, the also that that uh, sensitivity is rooted in feelings of shame or embarrassment for many people, and shame is a very very difficult uh, emotion to engage with. Uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, it feels like you can't really do much about it. Um, it's really debilitating. So somebody who's um, easily defensive, for example, that is often uh, sort of a coping strategy for keeping people from being able to help to make the person engage with the underlying shame that they have. So if you start to address that shame, that can help. Um, typically, the way to do that is both through the optimization of the treatment so that, in fact, you feel more empowered to deal with the ADHD symptoms. Also, there is a, a, a form of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is uh, quite good at dealing with the um, uh, stories that we tell ourselves, you know, that this is something to be ashamed about. Um, is a story you tell yourself. Um, and when you start to think about ADHD in a more neutral way, um, then you can start to move away from, uh, from those feelings of shame and start to feel uh, more proud of the positives of um, the ADHD also. As, as you were talking about in the video, part of the reason that pe people fall in love with people who have ADHD is because of their ADHD, right? They're exciting, they're interesting, they're lively, they're energetic, they're, there's all sorts of positive uh, reasons. So starting to hone in on those. Um, the other side of this is that, and so there is the, um, the physiological aspect of creating a lot of emotion, including the shame, including whatever. It's not just about anger or whatever. People with ADHD have brains that create a lot of emotion and they have very poor breaks uh, or, or inhibitions around that emotion. They, they don't, it, it, if it's there, it comes out. Um, and so some of that can be managed um, medicinally. Uh, rejection sensitive dysphoria is sort of the extreme side of having these large emotions. It's something that's getting a lot of conversation in the U.S. now about uh, as an aspect of ADHD for many people. And it actually has different medications that people use to address those specific symptoms. Again, this is why having target symptoms is so important because if you're addressing emotional issues, it's a different set of medications. You can use them alongside a stimulant for focus or whatever, but uh, but it, it, you know, knowing what you're trying to deal with is important. On the non-ADHD side of things, lots of times things that people say, oh, well, that wasn't a criticism, actually is a criticism. And so being aware of that uh, and much more sensitive to it, I'm not suggesting that a good long-term pattern is to be walking on eggshells or never be able to express yourself. But if you say something like, um, 
you know, I can't believe uh, the trash didn't, you know, th that the trash didn't get taken out again, or I can't believe you didn't take out the trash again, or something like that. That's a critique. It's not a complaint. And, uh, and there are lots of subtle ways where the remainder, the unspoken remainder of the sentence is actually critical. Um, you know, why didn't you put the, uh, why did you put the colors and the whites in the washing machine at the same time? They say, well, that's a question, but actually it's a critique <laughs> because you're commenting on the fact that they did something you don't like. Um, so being much more sensitive to the numbers of critiques or educations or whatever that are coming out um, is, uh, is important. Doesn't mean that you don't want to have a conversation around how to do the laundry, but you have to be thinking about, you know what, I need to own the fact that actually the way I'm saying things and the kinds of things that I'm choosing to say um, and choosing to speak about um, could be considered critical and the comment is actually legitimate. So owning your own stuff on both sides um, is important. Yeah, thank you. I think it's important to, uh, as I said, own your own stuff. Um, I don't know whether this came out earlier uh, in the introduction or in your presentation, but um, for those of um, you who didn't know, Melissa actually is a non-ADHD spouse in an ADHD relationship. So uh, many of the things that she wrote about in her book and that she's talking about now actually is from her own experience as well as the people that she worked with. And one of the things that um, I, I learned, I think the first time I heard you, was when you were talking about distractibility and that being like the number one um, reason why, why there was tension in marriages. And, and I did share about that in my video too. And uh, one of the questions that came up was, you know, about uh, somebody that's dating a partner with ADHD. And then, you know, when they're done um, with an activity, they, they feel that they've basically been put in the background. The partner's no longer engaged with them and it triggers it triggers them. And somebody else asked too about distractibility from the aspect of sex. You know, they just like, you know, they're just not into it anymore. So again, how do you handle distractibility? Because the non-ADHD point of view is really um, rejected or mm -hmm. just unloved. Right. And so first of all, the, the, the sort of overarching idea is don't take it personally. It's a symptom. <laughs> it isn't about whether your partner loves you. On the other hand, it's very painful. Right. So as a couple, you do actually need to deal with it. You can't just say, oh, well, I happen to have ADHD and therefore I get distracted and you're just going to have to live with that. That's not a good outcome for the other partner that you need to be able to feel confident that the, that you feel loved. There has to be enough of those positive reinforcing. I am focused on you things um, to to make a strong relationship. So you have to more think more overtly about where do you make those connections and how. If you have a partner who, you know, after you finish eating, um, stands up from the table before you're even done and goes over and starts watching TV, um, that's, that would be considered rude behavior, at least in my household, um, regardless of whether ADHD is there or is a reason for it. So there needs to be some way, some conversation around, um, hey, that makes me feel um, not, not well valued uh, and figure out what would keep the interest going in that, in that situation. You know, is it certain kinds of conversations? Is it having your meals in a room where there isn't a TV so that, that the, it's harder to just wander off? Um, you know, is it um, having music going? For example, music is something that tends to calm the ADHD mind um, in the background. And so, you know, maybe there are some other things that need to be happening, or maybe there's a, a, a task that that person would do, like, being responsible for cleaning off the table or whatever that they can't do until the other partner is done. And, you know, there, there are little strategies that you can use um, to do that. There, distractibility in sex is a thing, um, and there are different ways to handle it. Um, uh, one is uh, uh, to change up the sex so that it is interesting. Again, if you think of ADHD as a reward-focused brain, uh, the, the, you know, you can, you can vary, um, your sexual interactions in a way that maybe make it feel, um, more interesting or intriguing or, or capture the attention more. Some people with ADHD will create a, um, a, a sex life rhythm that, um, uh, acknowledges their need to, um, take a stimulant medication or something that helps them stay focused. Um, now for some people, the stimulant medications 
have the opposite impact. It makes it more difficult for them to have sex. That's one side effect for some people. If that's the case, then you have to do the opposite, which is have sex before you get the stimulants on board. Uh, so, it, you know, again, this is all about looking at your own situation and saying, okay, you know, it, what's the sexual equivalent of setting the 10 minute timer? For example, I'm not suggesting people set timers, but something that gamifies it or makes it more fun or interesting or, um, um, pulls it together for you. And, um, so that's one possibility. Thank you. I know that in terms of my own distractibility, you know, what I have to do is be very intentional about making time, you know, for my other half purposely actually blocking out time. Yeah. So like, you know, yeah, that, like a meeting time. Yeah. And, and it, you know, it doesn't have to be like every moment of every day. It just has to be enough so that the two of you feel connected and also feel like you have time to get on with your lives as, as whatever it is that you need to be doing. But that uh, intentionality of saying, I'm going to block out time to really focus on my partner. This is one reason why vacations are so great. You take yourself out of the normal household distractions and commitments and, and tasks and all that stuff and just focus on being together, doing interesting and fun things. It's like right up the ADHD and other partners uh, alleys. It's so much fun. But you can do little mini vacations with each other even throughout the week like we did on Saturday afternoons or um, you know, having a little routine where you have coffee together in the morning for 15 minutes and just you know are together and, and relaxed or starting up or whatever you do. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there, there was another question that was asked about the parent-child relationship, mm -hmm. you know, the, um, where the person felt that they've actually worked very hard, you know, on managing their symptoms and they're making some progress, but then inevitably there'll be some oops moments. And it yeah. just happens that, you know, those oops moments get pounced on. And then it's yeah. all the way back regression again. So like, <laughs> again, how do you manage that? Well, so there are a couple of different things going on there. Um, one is that by the time you've been struggling for a while, um, non-ADHD partners tend to carry around quite a bit of anxiety with them. And what they're most anxious about is they don't want to revert to the old ways. And so they're monitoring the progress that the ADHD partner is making and are highly sensitized to whether or not that partner is successful. It's almost like a series of tests <laughs> that the partner needs to sort of uh, pass those tests and whatever. It takes a long time for a non-ADHD partner to let go of that anxiety or feel reassured enough to trust that their partner is actually going to be more reliable. And so um, it's helpful to keep that in mind. We are all human. And uh, we will make mistakes. People with ADHD are, uh, will, because of the symptoms, um, be more up and down than people who don't have ADHD. That's just the nature of the beast. So even if you're managing ADHD really well, there's still going to be things that are inconsistent. And that's okay. You know, we are human. Um, and so um, I think uh, it's, it's important for non-ADHD partners to be to acknowledge that they're over wary and over sensitized to um, their partner's um, approach. Uh, again, you know who gets to decide which approach is just right or whether you know uh, the non-ADHD partners if they change their mind it's okay, but if their ADHD partner does something right off of the you know outside the script it's not okay. That's that's that anxiety. You have to let go of some of those things and acknowledge, hey, we're equal partners. We're both adults. You can change direction. It isn't a question of whether you change direction. It's a question of, do you meet your deadlines adequately? And do you communicate the change in direction adequately? You know, are you hiding it and trying to like, you know, oh, well, I didn't do that. I'm not going to talk to you about it. Or are you upfront and is it neutral? Hey, you know what? I said I was going to do this on Tuesday. Turns out something came up. I haven't had a chance to get to it yet. I'm aiming for Thursday. That gets rid of a lot of the problems. But again, when you've been struggling and when you feel like your partner's not going to accept that or you're going to get you know, yelled at or you're going to be told you're a failure or whatever, people tend not to do that. So this is part of the relearning experience that you have to go through, which is, um, is how to interact around um, what happens with ADHD. The other thing is if you, you know, if you're not optimizing the treatment, if you're, if it doesn't look as if you're genuinely engaged with the, uh, um, with what you're trying to do, you know, if you have difficulty planning and you don't put into place a better system for how to plan, 
yeah, your partner's going to have a beef with that because not much is going to change. You can't just focus, you know, you can't just try harder. You actually have to try differently. If you have ADHD, you have to try the things that work for people with ADHD. I don't need to set a 10 minute timer to clean up my kitchen, but the woman with the ADHD did and it worked for her. Um, and so, you know, it's finding those strategies that, um, where you can say, look, I, I don't have to be perfect, but I am engaged with this. I am trying to communicate with you, um, uh, ac accurately. And some couples have a, like everyday check-in briefly in the morning or the evening before or whatever, just to say, here's what I'm thinking I'm going to be doing tomorrow as a way to just stay coordinated so that there's less anxiety on the part of the non-ADHD partner. Thank you. Thank you for that. Again, I, I love how you um, combine the medication aspect, you know, with the CBT and also the interactions, because it really is not just one, one tool, right? It's, it's really multimodal. Um, mm -hmm. The other question, because, you know, for those of us who are living this, you know, in, in a relationship, in a marriage, and we know there are challenges, um, we, we don't easily get out of this relationship. It's, it's pretty much like a permanent relationship most times. But what about those who are not in a relationship yet or who are just starting a relationship and um, they find out that the person that they're interested in, you know, has ADHD and, and they already have maybe attended the seminar or they've read you know, an article somewhere or they themselves are the ADHD -er, and um, they're not sure when, if ever, I guess it will come up at some point, but when should they share about the condition? Well, I mean, on your first date, no, you don't need to. Um, <laughs> Um, I think at the point at which you are uh, genuinely interested in the person, um, then um, you know sharing the diagnosis is um, is important. The one of the things that happens in these relationships is part of the chemistry of infatuation is extra dopamine. So when you're falling in love with somebody, there's a lot of extra dopamine, and in fact, you're probably highly attentive. To your partner and that lasts uh, from 24 to 28 months and then the dopamine levels go back to normal which <clears throat> if you have ADHD it means low and that's when you start to see the lack of attention and etc so the other partner may not be aware of the symptoms even if you have them or maybe thinking oh gee this person's really energetic or really has lots of great ideas or whatever there's a lot there's sort of a positive two-year buffer in there where where you can talk about ADHD and about what it might mean in the future and bring it out where a lot of that stuff isn't yet showing up. Um, uh, I think having a tr very transparent conversations around ADHD after you are um, really genuinely interested in somebody is really important. I also think that waiting before you decide to actually get married is also important. Um, some couples deal better with the impacts of ADHD, with the symptom response, response cycles, with making ADHD neutral than others. And it serves you both well to wait until after the dopamine rush has worn off to see what you really are looking like as a couple. That's hard to do because uh, one part of the hyperfocus courtship is we're perfect for each other. Let's do it, and you <laughs> rush into uh, uh, to getting um, permanently engaged with each other. But um, it's good to wait at least three years um, after meeting each other, just to make sure you have the coping strategies in place, and that you are able to um, interact around the symptoms in a neutral a neutral way. It's also really good if you have ADHD and you're not currently partnered to learn about the patterns and to learn about how to speak up for yourself if the patterns start. So it is, you know, the, if the ADHD partner is capable of saying, hey, it's, you're, it's starting to feel as if you're managing me and, and that doesn't feel good to me and we need to work through this rather than just escaping or going like, oh, this doesn't feel good and going off into a corner, you're much more likely to have a good um, relationship. There's actually a book I've been um, reading lately that I really like, which uh, helps with this process. Actually, it helps also with getting out of parent-child dynamics. It's called Boundary Boss. And I don't have the woman's name here. Terry Cole, I think, is the author. Um, but it's it, one of the things about parent-child dynamics and about many of these patterns is that they express difficult or poor boundaries between partners. The inability to stand up for what's important for you and really express it clearly to your partner. 
Um, and so that's a workbook type uh, self-help book that can help people. Thank you. Thank you for that link. Um, you know, we can also share that on the website, you know, um, so people can look for it later. Um, there was a question that, as well that was um, pre-submitted. Um, that was to do with trust issues. Um, it um, was a question about someone um, whose wife has ADHD and has a young child, and then non-ADHD spouse was fearful um, that, the, that the ADHD spouse would be forgetful when he's away at work and may inadvertently harm the child or just not be careful. And uh, that's quite an easy um, situation. So um, just wanted to ask that question. Yeah, so trust is a huge issue um, and rebuilding trust takes time. Um, I, I, I uh, well, it's pretty complicated to get into, but um, in that case, safety for a, a child is critically important. Um, and there are things you might be able to anticipate or do that would help improve the safety. Um, I think that some of the fears that people have about the actual safety of their kids are more about the anxiety than they are about the about um, an actual situation where the child might actually be physically harmed or endangered. Um, but for example, a simple example, um, you have two cars perhaps and you have one car seat. And one of the safety issues might be that the ADHD partner or one of you might not buckle in the car seat well. Um, the way to get at that is to have two car seats so that you don't have to unbuckle them <laughs> and, and transfer them back and forth. So uh, another one that I've run into is with safety of medications where an ADHD partner is not really aware of the fact that they're leaving medications out or that they're leaving cleaning solutions out or something like that. They're not paying attention to it. Um, those are the kinds of safety issues where you can say, okay, the non-ADHD partner is simply always going to be in charge of the medications because the potential for the negative outcome is just too dire if it happened to happen. But a lot of these things about will my child be safe at the park or will my child, um, you know, uh, be cared for in a good enough way or whatever um, may or may not be life-threatening. Um, and if they're not life-threatening, um, then I think uh, it's good for a child to have a different, you know, multiple approaches to how they are, are managed. Um, when it comes to uh, trust in general, um, it's often broken down by, the, by um, issues around responsibilities, around um, in, inconsistency and in performance for an ADHD partner, those kinds of things. And, uh, and it takes a long time to rebuild that. Part of that is having the ADHD partner um, genuinely engaging with managing their ADHD so that they become more reliable. And that would be true also with the, uh, the parent issues, uh, the concerns about the children. Um, and uh, also um, it has to do with communication, transparent communication as well as engagement around the issues that really matter to both partners um, is the way to start to rebuild um, the trans that, that one part of trust. Another part of trust has to do with um, sort of moral, what they call moral certainty or ethical, the ethical nature of a person. Um, that's harder to rebuild if you've run into some major um, issues there around cheating or those kinds of things. There you probably need professional assistance. But when it comes to sort of daily interactions around life, there's a difference between something being annoying or frustrating and it actually being endangering. And so trying to sort that out. And if it's truly endangering, getting a different system in place. And if it's just annoying, allowing that you have two different ways to do things. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, there was um, a question here about um, medication. And you know, what if someone's been taking medication, let's say like Ritalin for some time and then has developed the tolerance. So it's no longer working as well as it did before. Um, then um, what are some of the other ways that they could try to manage the symptoms? Well, first of all, if you've been taking a medication for a long time, there is some evidence that if you take a medication vacation for a one to two weeks, that that can sort of restart its effectiveness in your body. So that's something to try. Um, and pick a time where the fact that you're not taking medication um, won't impact you dramatically. Um, but one part of the reason that I talk about that physio physiological leg for managing ADHD is it's not just about medication. 
It's about the behavioral strategies. So you might hire a coach um, to be able to get the behavioral strategies better structured. You might start an exercise program. It might be that you're in a particularly stressful period in your life and your symptoms are worse because of the stress. Lowering the stress levels will make the symptoms more mild and maybe then the medication will have more impact. Um, uh, you know, same thing with sleep stuff. If, if you have sleep deprivation of any sort, your ADHD symptoms are made worse. And sleep issues are very common for people with ADHD, including um, sleep apnea and uh, disturbances that are actually um, can be treated like with a CPAP machine or something like that. And, and uh, so that's another path to explore. Um, one of the first ones I would explore, actually, if you have any issues at all with sleep. Um, because again, if you lessen the severity of the symptoms, then even if the medication isn't working as well as it used to, uh, it still might show an improvement. You can also change the medication that you're taking. And it, particularly if you're in the stimulant category, there are different types of stimulants. Maybe you find something else would work for you for a while. Um, um, if that vacation, um, from the stimulant doesn't work. If you're going to take a vacation from your stimulant, by the way, make sure you tell your partner <laughs> and don't take a, don't take a, a immediate vacation from an antidepressant or something that has a withdrawal syndrome uh, associated with it because it'll make you very irritable and uh, uncomfortable. Uh, if you're taking those kinds of medications, you should probably talk with your doctor about um, how to take a vacation from a medication if you wish to do that because some of them you have to take get down off of very slowly in order to not... Um, be exceptionally irritable and mean. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of technical issues too with that. And so we'll always say, go and you know, go back and speak with your doctor. Yeah. Because, um, he or she will be in the best position to help out on this one. Um, we don't really have time for too many more questions, but we have so many questions that came in. So <laughs> at least that shows you there's a lot of interest, you know, in the work that you do, Melissa. Um, I would like to, um, you know, the last one or two more questions. Uh, one is to do with support. Um, you know, we have a question, I think, from someone in, um, who's attending today that said that their husband has ADHD and probably a couple of the kids. And as a non-ADHD person in the, in the family, and sometimes they are outnumbered, um, how, how do they do their part to support um, and still cope with the frustrations that, that they face? Because really, you know, when you're severely outnumbered, it can be hard to manage and in self-care as well for yourself. Yeah, it is. Self-care is important. Um, finding boundaries is really important. So that book that I talked about um, can really help you sort through what are the absolute positive must-haves <laughs> and in terms of both what I need to be able to be happy in my life and my relationship versus, you know, the sort of things that would be nice. Um, uh, and there's a difference and you fight for the stuff you absolutely positively must have and you really engage with your partner around that or with your kids around that. Dealing with kids with ADHD is quite different than dealing with partners with ADHD because the expectations around what your role is going to be are much more clear-cut. It's expected that a parent is going to help a child figure out what they're doing, um, what they should, you know, whether they should be taking medications or not, whether or not the school can give them any kind of accommodations, and if so, what kinds, teach, helping teaching them study strategies that work, and there are many of them for students with ADHD, uh, those kinds of things. So there's sort of a teacher, ment a mentor, mentee kind of a thing that goes on with parenting uh, actual kids with ADHD. Not the case with the partner. Um, with the partner, there's an expectation of equality. Um, and so it's a much trickier um, situation actually. But self-care, if you are surrounded by people who have ADHD, first of all, working on the anxiety that that produces will be useful <laughs> because this idea that things are gonna get dropped and that you have to mentally, if not physically, be on top of everything and managing everything creates a great deal of stress. So things that, you know, getting some time to yourself, having your own spaces, one of the things that can help if you have the space for this in your home is to have a room that is your room that is when you need a re place to retreat to, whether it's to meditate or to read or to get something done or to do an art project or whatever it is, something that soothes your soul. Um, that you can have that, that you can close the door or uh, and, and the other people in the family understand that that means you're not to be interrupted. That can be very useful. Um, making sure you've got the support you need. Um, and also that the people with the ADHD are engaged with that as, as best they can be. Again, that turning towards 
um, is very helpful. The more neutral the presence of the ADHD is in your household, the easier it is, is to be able to, to live with it and, um, and in fact succeed. You know, I think in my household now, you know, two out of four of us and in some households even more, right? Um, and I think the, the thing that helps is just that it's, it's part of the daily conversation now. Mm -hmm. So it, it's become sort of like, you know, sometimes we roll our eyes at each other, but there's a little bit more understanding and compassion. So that yeah. makes it a little bit easier to deal with. It's normalized in that sense. Well, and it then is therefore less threatening, right? I mean, one of the issues is just this sense of overwhelm that there's all this stuff, you're totally responsible for it. If the conversation is more open and if the people who have ADHD are actually responsible for their own ADHD and are taking that seriously, that's a huge pressure off of the non-ADHD partner. It's not that there isn't stuff you have to do. This whole leg three engagement stuff is there's, there is stuff. And when you have kids, you definitely are involved with it. But if that conversation is open and neutral and and um, um, you know non-judgmental, and if you can develop a sense of humor and flexibility, um, all of that helps. And and also make sure that you're doing lots of fun stuff, right? I mean, one of the mistakes that I made. I'm a natural-born manager. I was a great mom, or am a great mom. Everybody would tell you that, including my kids. So that that's not an issue there. But I spent way too much time trying to keep things organized. Um, and I could, I would have been uh, pleased if I, I, looking back on it, if I had spent more time engaging and just being with everything that was going on and, you know, like uh, all of the craziness um, and being more relaxed about it. And that would have been useful um, for, you know, for everybody. I totally get you on that one. <laughs> it's being, you know, in, in that present and enjoying that moment. Um, Melissa, thank you very much, you know, for all your answers. And it really, the most important thing is very actionable, very practical and very relatable. So I uh, really thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pass the time to Yuan, um, who's going to share the um, you know, post-event poll, because we really like to see um, how you guys found this evening and whether, you know, what um, you heard tonight is something that was helpful to you. So um, Yuan, can you um, please share the poll? And you know, while the poll is coming on, on the screen, you know, Lisa, feel free to ask questions and you know, let us know how you found the event so far. Some of the questions that were asked, are they similar to like what's being asked in the US when you do your talks? Oops, I think you're, you're on mute. You have to unmute yourself. I didn't realize I had gotten back muted up. Um, they are uh, very much uh, the questions. These are human responses, you know, the idea that you want to be paid attention to by the people you care about most or that um, that feeling anxiety is not a good thing. Um, are, it's just human uh, stuff. So these are the same exact same kinds of questions that I get in the U.S. Um, we're lucky over here in that we have more awareness of ADHD, I think, um, but uh, still not enough resources for people. So I like to be able to be given opportunities like this one to talk to folks and to and to make them aware that there are some resources out there that they can avail themselves of. And and I, I, I do try to answer questions when they come my way. So feel free to contact me. I can't guarantee you I'll get back to you within a few days, but it will be within a few weeks at least. So I try really hard to do that. So, um, uh, you know, I'm delighted to be here and thank you so much for having invited me. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, really, really touched by this because you really take the time to reply people. That's the thing that really amazed me. Um, please continue to um, answer the poll questions, by the way. Um, and again, for those of you who are interested to find out more about, you know, the issues that Melissa was sharing about today, please pick up a book. You can get it on ebook, um, The ADHD Effect on Marriage. In fact, um, you know, a couple of my friends actually have read your book and they were the ones who introduced it to me. Ah, and, well, you know, there you go, yes, word yes. of mouth. <laughs> and, um, you know, we do have a short book review as well on the Unlocking ADHD website. And I just thought it was so important that we have this extra layer of knowledge about the impact of ADHD on marriages and long-term relationships. Because yeah. due to lack of awareness by ADHD, you know, this thing is not being addressed. And the thing it's that's so addressable. It is addressable. I mean, there are things that are, that are intractable that are the nature of... 
um, distraction or, you know, having difficulty managing. I mean, you manage ADHD for the rest of your life. You don't cure ADHD. And so there are issues uh, around, around that. Um, but, uh, but also I have a strong belief in, in the, you know, the power to love and empathize and, and um, <clears throat> really care. Once you understand, it's really hard to care about somebody if you think that they're doing things to hurt you intentionally. And when you understand that that's not what's going on, it's a big relief. Uh, and, uh, and it doesn't mean you don't have things to deal with. It doesn't mean that you wouldn't feel frustration or anger or any of those things. Um, but at least there's a path that you can follow that, uh, or, or organize around in your own life, um, that helps things uh, be much, uh, much better between you. Thank you. Um, we're coming to like 10.01 and we want to be really respectful of your time. And by the way, everyone, you know, if you haven't thanked Melissa, she actually made sure she was up early to join us at 5.30 a.m. her time. So that means she woke up much earlier than that. Okay, now so, you can see outside, it's starting to be dawn now. Things yes, are starting. So, so we really are appreciative of that because, you know, I mean, I can't imagine waking, probably woke up at 4.30, 4 o'clock. Um, uh, yeah. th thank you for this because it really is impactful and life-changing. So um, everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're just going to close the poll another couple of seconds. So if you haven't answered, please do. I think we have about 58% participation rate. So I think a little bit better than earlier. Um, I'll leave it to Yen to, to um, you know, finish um, ending the poll. But people are actually thanking you as well in the chats. Um, I, I think it's been that. quite and, an and intense I'm so conversation. Delighted. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm really delighted to be able to talk to people. I really have a passion for this. And as I said, it's really fun to be able to do this work because it makes such a difference for people. And, and you know, I'll, I just spread the knowledge and the ideas and then people grab onto them and do, work with them. So, yeah, and we really hope to be able to partner with you, Melissa, on, you know, doing more of this kind of impactful work in Singapore and in Asia. So that and more, I'd be delighted to do yeah, that. More, more families can be helped. Looking forward to it. So guys, please check out uh, Melissa, her website, ADHDmarriage.com, um, her books, her seminars. And for Unlocking ADHD, please join our support group on Facebook. We also have a group on Discord. And just keep in touch. Hope to see some of you at our event tomorrow night. Uh, wishing you a good evening. Thank you, Melissa. We'll be in touch. And uh, have a good evening, everyone. Keep in touch. Take care.